Happy Father's Day to all your fathers out there. Yeah. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. And so excited to have this group of Ruby and Bob. And Ernest and Dawn visiting us for the first time. Amen. Yeah. So glad to have you with us. Yeah. Anybody else you came for the first time? Oh, well, there's the Amen. All the way in the back. Yeah. 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 Jay Z. Oh, he makes it so hard to preach. <laughs> if you have grandkids, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Luke chapter 15. I gotta get crazy because I'll take off and go with him. <laughs> verse 11. One verse, but keep your Bibles open because we're going to look at the whole uh, story. One verse 11 says, And he said, A man had two sons. What a, this is a good thing to preach on Father's Day. A man had two sons. The Bible, is, this, this story has been preached possibly more than any other story in the Bible. You don't even have to be a Christian to know this story. And you have... If you've been in the church long enough, you know that it's been preached from every angle possible. Yeah. I mean, it represents God, Satan, and the church. Yeah. It also represents Jesus, the sinner, and the Christian. It also represents the righteous, the rebellious, and the religious. And it represents grace, sin, and legalism. And so, and I've preached on this many times. I, I lost track of how many times I've preached from this text. Because it's just a powerful text. And it's usually referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. But if you notice, the word prodigal is not even in there. Even though the boy, what, Misha, is that you over there too? And Misha. You. you said once a month and I was waiting. Okay. See guys, you think we can't see anything up here. We see everything. But it's not just the story of the prodigal son that's in here. But if you look in here, there's another boy in here, the elder son. And then there's also the father. And so there's three main characters in this story. And being how this is Father's Day, I'm going to preach from this using this title. Are you ready for this? The Sons of the Father. You've heard the sins of the father before. The sins of the father usually make the sons of the father suffer. Amen. Right? Because it's our, the sins of the Father are handed down from generations. So the sins of the Father make the sons of the Father suffer. But in this story, and maybe in some of your lives today, it's the sons of the Father that make the father of the son suffer, or the parents of the son suffer. And so to get a better understanding of what Jesus is trying to say here, you have to understand what's going on. It's, the, it's just one part of a three-part answer to the religious leaders of his day. Because the religious leaders, if you look at it, chapter opens up with Jesus drawing a crowd of sinners unto himself. How terrible is that? I mean, he's got the most despicable people following him around. Sinners of all shapes and all sizes and all different kinds of sins. And, and, uh, and the, the religious leaders are criticizing him for receiving sinners. And as I look over this congregation today, I think every one of us can be thankful that Jesus Christ received sinners because every one of us did enough in our lives to be lost. Did you hear that? Every one of us sitting in this room have done enough to be lost. Every one of us. But I thank God that Jesus receives sinners. Yes. But here they were criticized. Oh, there's somebody else new back there too. See the eyes. Uh, uh, and she goes, "Ask me, but I forget your first name." Diane. Diane. How could I forget that? Nice to have you with us. Let's see. Make sure I hang out everybody else. So that I don't get interrupted here. <laughs> Was I? So they're criticizing Jesus for ministering to sinners. You know, there's people out there that don't want sinners in their church. They don't want the lowlifes in their church, the undesirables in their church. 
So instead of lashing out at them, Jesus gives them the answer why he's doing this. And he does it in three parts and he shares these three stories. Three stories about something law. So I want to look at law story number one. He tells about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one of them get lost. Now think about that for a minute. He has a hundred sheep and one of them get lost. So that tells me that you can be a sheep and still be lost. There's a lot of people who think that sheep can't get lost. You can be a sheep and still get lost. You can get out of the fold. Ninety-nine of them were cared and safe, uh, cared for and safe, but one of them went astray. And he was a sheep. He wasn't a wolf. He was a sheep. One of them went astray. And he was out there somewhere. He was in harm's way with the wolves roaming around and with all the pitfalls and all the dangers out there. And if you notice in this first story, it shows the significance of one sheep out of a hundred. That's one percent. God is interested in one percent of sinners out there even. The shepherd didn't dismiss this one sheep as meaningless and insignificant. Oh, I have 99 more. Why, why should I be concerned about that one? It doesn't matter how insignificant someone is or how unimportant you think you are. I want you to know today that God thinks you're significant. Yeah. And he leaves 99, he leaves the 99% and he goes, he leaves them in a safe place and he goes to search for the one lost one. I was the one lost one. You were the one lost one. Hallelujah. He's searching today, likewise. Yeah, yeah. And some of us are so smug in our church that we get upset and feel slighted at times. But he has the title of not only shepherd, but he, but he has the title of savior. He yeah, came to yes. seek and save Man. that which was lost. Yeah. And if there's someone who needs saving, he as a shepherd knows that his flock is safe. And knows that his flock yes. is because he entrusted him with us. We're right. called the under shepherd. He entrusts the flock with us, and then he devotes his time to looking for the lost one. Thank you, Lord. So you matter to him, whether you're saved yes. or whether you're unsaved today. You matter to God. Yeah. And sometimes saved people, Christians like the religious leader of Jesus' day, they don't like it when the unsaved people come in. Wow. Have you ever been in a church that was like that? I, I've been in churches that were that way. I mean, they're going to ruin their carpets. They're going to ruin up. They're, they're going to bring bed bugs in there. And, and all these things, you know. Here's the economic level. You know you ever go to the uh, uh, amusement park and you can't get on the ride unless you're this tall. Some churches you can't get in unless you have this much money. You can't get in unless you have clothes that are this acceptable. <laughs> I mean, it sounds funny, but there's really places out there like that. They don't like it when unsaved people come in. But look what it says in verse 7. That Jesus said there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. That means he's going to give more attention to the sinner than he does to the saints who are already saved. I don't know, that just irritates me right there. You think it doesn't irritate you? Yeah. How about Spectrum? They give better deal to the prospective customer than the ones who've been a customer for a long time. But God values the sinner without devaluing the saint. And then he moves on to the story of the next one, the lost sheep, lost story number two. And he tells the story of a, a lost coin. And in the story, a woman has ten silver coins, and she loses one. Now, a hundred sheep, and he loses one, that's one percent. Now he goes to ten coins, and she loses one, that's ten percent. Yeah. And so, uh, some commentaries place the value of this coin at around $1,200 uh, in today's currency, and it's lost. She has no clue where it is. But you know something? Even though that coin was lost, it still never lost its value. Even when it was lost, it never loses its value. She didn't just dismiss this coin as worthless, and some of us do that. They're lost, they've lost their value to the church, they've lost their value, they're worthless. She didn't dismiss it as worthless. She didn't say, oh, well, I have nine others that aren't lost. 
You know what she does? She starts house cleaning. Yes. And I stopped there this morning. I got sidetracked on it. And I, I think the Lord wants me to get sidetracked again. She starts house cleaning. Let me tell you something, church. Part of your Christian witness is your house cleaning. Yes. I mean, that's part of your... Oh, I can't, I, I can't, I'm not even going to look a little things this way. That's part of your Christian testimony is what your house looks like. Somebody say amen or oh my. So this woman starts house cleaning. She starts sweeping. She starts vacuuming. I don't think she vacuumed because she didn't want to suck it up. But she, she's moving the rug. She, she's sweeping and moving things around. And here's the deal. She, she just got it in her. Even though she had nine more, she could not be content until she found that one coin. Why? Because it had value. And I don't think that Jesus is content even though the house of God may be full all across this city. I don't think He's content with people in church when there are lost coins and lost sheep out there. Hallelujah. And we shouldn't be content either. Why? Because if they're valuable to Him, they ought to be valuable to us. They may seem worthless. I just hate them. I hate it when somebody refers to another human being as worthless or, or uh, uh, useless or un... un undesirables, all these words that people use to put on people that aren't as good as I am. So if they're not as good as I am, they must be worthless. Well, you're not as good as somebody else, so maybe that makes you worthless. But I just don't like that word, worthless. And she never refers to this thing as worthless. And the reason that it's valuable to him, these people that we would call worthless sometimes, is that, listen to this, that coin that she lost had a stamp on it, an image of the Roman authority that was marked on it. And we, the Bible says, have a stamp on us. We were made in the image of God. We have the image of God stamped on us. And even the lost ones out there have the image of God stamped on them. All they need to be is redeemed and restored. But they're still valuable. They still have the image marked on them. Hallelujah. And when she finds this coin, what does she do? She calls all of her friends and relatives together and they begin to celebrate. And now he's, he's sharing this story with the religious leaders and they're wondering, where is he going with these two stories? What point is he trying? They can't relate to anything in this at all. What point is he trying to make? Listen to this. Sometimes religion can keep you from seeing the truth. So then Jesus says to the religious ladies says, come on, let me take you to my final story, law story number two, two, or number three, three. A man has two sons, the sons of the father. Now the lost sheep represented 1% that Jesus goes after. The lost coin represents 10%, and now the sons of the father, one of two is 50%. So it goes from 1% to 10% to 50%. Why? It doesn't matter what percentage of sinner you are. Jesus is out to get you. You're sitting here this morning. I want you to know he's out to get you. So he starts telling these religious leaders about this nameless younger son. And this boy really sets up the entire story, like, although the story is not all about him. But he sets up the story. And we're not told how old or how young he was. But I'm guessing somewhere around 17 and 18. Some, something happens when you're 17 and 18. You start getting itchy feet. You want to get out. And he says, I don't, I don't want to wait until you die, he said. I don't want to wait until you die before I get what's coming to me. Now, Sean's going to have to wait till I die before he gets my guitars. So you know what he tells me? Dad, have some bacon. I don't want to wait until you die before I get what's coming to me. I, I can I can really use this now because I want to go out and I want to see the world a little bit. There's more to life out there than I want to experience. And if you look at it, an inheritance is usually given after the father dies. But he can't wait for his father to die. He wants it now. 
And the father says, okay, if that's what you want. And the father divides the inheritance up and gives the boy his. He says, now here's your inheritance. Here's your money. But here's the, here's the deal. Here's the rule. You can go out there and experience the world if you want to. You can use the money for anything you want to. But you're not going to do it and live here. Now this is the number one Father's Day rule of all time. As long as you're under my roof, you'll obey my laws. Amen? And so that's what he's telling the boy. If you want to do your own thing, that's fine. But you're not going to do it here. I just shared with somebody in New Believers class. You're not going to do it here. Go out there. Because here, here's the thing. Out there, they're responsible. If they do it under your roof, you're responsible. Okay, so uh, he says you do it out there. And so he says you're old enough to make your own decisions in life. And you're also old enough to make your own mistakes. And so he gives them a share of the inheritance. And, uh, because once a child reaches a certain age, they have the right to be wrong. Yes, amen. We want them to be right all the time. But they have a right to be wrong. And so he knew, and parents, you you got to understand this. You cannot, I, I'm talking when they get, I'm talking when they're 18 years old. Up to that time, you better not let them have their way. But when they hit a certain age, You've got to realize that you cannot live your life for them. And he realized, his father realized that he couldn't live the son's life for him. And he knew that he couldn't protect them from making all the wrong choices. And good parenting means covering your children with the blood. Yes. And knowing yes. when to let them go. Amen. And trust that seed that was planted in their life. Yes. I don't know when the seed's going to take place. But trust the seed that was planted. And so the younger son begins to gather all of his stuff together, and he heads into a distant country. And I said this morning that we have two who have graduated from high school. Uh, Philip, and Philip was in the first service, and uh, Jubilee, uh, yeah. Delgado. And these two are going to be heading out at some point in their own lives to make their own decisions. And this is what I would tell them, this is what I told Philip today, that you don't have to go 3,000 miles away from home to be in a distant country. You can be in a distant country right at SUNY Binghamton. You can be in a distant country at SUNY Broom. You can be in a distant country right in your own apartment. You can walk out of the door of your parents' home and find yourself in a distant country where there's no rules and no curfews. And whether it's at school or work or another country, whenever you get away from the place that is ruled by the Word of God, you're going to find yourself in a distant country. So this man goes out into that distant country and finally he's free from accountability. He's free from, he doesn't have to be in at a certain time, he doesn't have to be bed at 9 o'clock. He, he's, you know, no curfews, free from restrictions, free from his father's rules. The tragedy with this young man, listen to this, the tragedy with this young man is that he wanted what his father had, but he didn't want his father. He wanted what his father had, but he didn't want his father. There are so many people who are like that with God. They want what God has or what God can give them, but they really don't want God. Because with God comes a set of rules. With God comes restrictions, commands. Oh, we want the hands of God, but not the face of God. So here he is, out there, no rules, no curfew, and he begins to live it up with the fast crowd. And he begins to attract all these people. Why? Because he's got a lot of money. Man, when you've got a lot of money, you're going to find yourself with a lot of friends. And he begins to party with these friends, and he's, he's footing the bill for all this. He's partying, he's drinking, and doing some drugs, and all manner of loose living. He's just funding everybody, and everybody thinks he's the life of the party. Everybody thinks he's the greatest thing going on. And all the things that his father prohibited from doing, he is now doing until every last cent of the estate, his share of the estate, is gone. Yeah. We'll just take a minute here. Katie's face is all red. James E. Oh, that's the 
having good fun with me already. Well, let's see. Diane interrupted me. Ernest and Dawn interrupted me. James interrupted me. Every last cent was gone. And coincidentally, and I call it God incidentally, there was a severe famine in the land at the exact same time. I think God ordained that. There was already a, a famine in land, by the way, what the prophet Amos said, a famine of hearing the word of God. And a fam that kind of famine is always there in the distant country. When you're out there in the distant country, you're not going to hear the word of God. There's a famine of the word of God in the distant country. But this was an economic value a famine. It says here that he began to be impoverished. That means that he was broke, absolutely broke. He's penniless. He couldn't afford to pay the rent, so he was kicked out. He's homeless. He couldn't buy food. He was starving. And the Bible says he hires himself out to a citizen of that country to work at this job that nobody else would do. It was a job of feeding pigs. Now, that might not sound like too much to you, but he was a Jewish boy, and they weren't supposed to have any contact with pigs, and here he is feeding pigs. This was the lowest of the low. And the pigs are getting more food than he's getting. Now, I came across this line. Listen to this. The citizen of the country, the one who hired him, wasn't interested in the welfare of this younger son. He was only interested in the pigs prospering. So what does that tell me? I don't care what you think. There's not a drug dealer out there that's interested in you. There's not a pimp out there that's interested in you. They're interested in prospering their business. And so he didn't care nothing about this, this young boy at all. And, and this, he wasn't earning enough to meet his needs, so he began to look at what he's feeding the pigs, and he, it begins to desire that. Yeah. He's beginning to desire pig slop. Yeah. Now, understand, he was Jewish, right? So here he is, yes. hungry, and he's surrounded. But let me tell you, if I'm hungry and, I, and I'm surrounded by cows, somebody's going to get barbecue. <laughs> He was here's a Jewish boy, hungry, starving, surrounded by pigs, and he can't eat ham. He he'd been living high in the hog, but now he's down with the pigs. Now where's the father in all this? The father knows how he raised his sons. He knows what they've been taught. He knows what he's instilled in their life. He knows, he, he knows that he did what he was supposed to do. He let the son go. And one of the most disturbing things about God for some people is that he doesn't keep people from doing wrong things. He lets them do anything they want. And they get annoyed with that. Well, if God was God, why didn't he stop the pedophile? And we get annoyed with it. See, we think that God should be more controlling when it comes to other people. We don't want Him to be more controlling with us, but other people. We would like Him to force them to do the right thing and to stop them from doing the wrong thing. But He doesn't overstep our free will. He's not going to stop you from doing the wrong thing. He's not going to force you to do the right thing. So he allows the boy to leave and the boy ends up just making a mess out of his life. And some of your kids are going to make a mess out of their life. Yeah. Yeah. And the boy squanders in a short time what it took his father a lifetime to accumulate. That's not a good Father's Day gift for that father. Here he is associating with the worst of the worst, now feeding pigs. So what does he do? He feels sorry for him. And he sends one of his servants and writes out a big old check. Here, son, I'm coming to help you out in your bad situation. That's what we would have done, many of us. No, he doesn't do that. What did he do when his son's life was a life of misery? 
First of all, you need to understand, and some of you already know, not only was the son's life a life of misery, but the father's life was a life of misery, seeing the life of misery of his son. Because every parent hurts. Oh, you should only know. Every parent hurts when their children are hurt. And even when the hurt is self-inflicted, we still hurt. But a good parent doesn't bail them out of a self-inflicted mess. So what did he do? He wasn't callous. He wasn't cold-hearted. He was broken-hearted for his son. And some of you women can relate to this too. And with pain in his heart, he continued to let go of that son. He waited and he watched and he prayed. That's the thing you to do. And he prayed for him every single day, always looking down the road in hopeful expectation that his son would return. He never gave up hope. But he never chased him into the pig pen. He never ran after him and threw a life preserver. Come on, let me help you out of the pig pen. Because if he did, two weeks later, the boy would be right back in the pig pen again. That's right. Especially you parents today who have raised your children up with the Word of God planted in them. I'm looking at Terry over there. I know most of Terry's kids. Every time I turn around, she has another one, though. Well, this is my daughter. Where'd that one come from? <laughs> but I know she's raised them up. She's planted that seed. They're all, they, all the, are they all walking with the Lord? No, mine aren't either. Pastor Brian's aren't either. Many of yours aren't either. Waited and walked and prayed. And you parents have raised your children up. Let me give you this encouragement in the Word of God planted to them. The Word of God is like a hook. They may be out there in the world. They may be in things that they shouldn't be in. They may have strayed. They may be out there in the pig pens of the world. But one day, the hook of the Word of God is going to get a hold of them if one day the Word of God, the hook of the Word of God is going to get a hold of them if you don't bail them out. If you don't enable them. If you continue to bail them out, you continue to nail them, uh, all you have on there is a hook without the bars. Uh-huh. Yes. Oh, boy. Mm. So every day the Father's out there. He's prayed up, he goes out there and he's looking. You know, sometimes when you pray for things, you got to expect it to happen. Yeah. You know that when you pray for rain, what they say, take an umbrella. You know, when you pray for something, expect it to happen. We do that on Wednesday. We pray expecting answers. Expectation is the atmosphere of miracles. And we're never going to see miracles if we don't expect miracles. You're never going to see your children come home if you don't expect them to. And so every day he goes out there after prayed up expecting, he says, hey, maybe this is going to be the day. You come to church with that attitude. Maybe this is going to be the day. And then he's out there the next day. Maybe this is going to be the day. He said, I'm praying and I'm waiting and I'm watching. And all the time he's doing this, something's happening in the pig pen that he doesn't even know about. We don't know how long the boy's been gone. The Bible doesn't tell us. But we know that the father is constantly praying and watching. And while he's praying and watching, he doesn't have a clue what's going on. There's something, there's something begins to circulate and, and gurgle in the pig pen. And as you watch and pray for your children, things begin to happen in the pig pen. You might not be aware of it. But something starts stirring in the pig pen. And the boy, in the, pig, the boy is in the pig pen, and it hits him. Amen. You know what the it is? The prayers of his father. Hallelujah. The father has no idea that the boy just got hit by the prayers. He just continued to pray. Amen. But suddenly, I shared this morning, it's like the, the soccer player that sat there, and he says, I see this white thing coming at me, and I don't know what it was, and then it hit me. <laughs> 
He's in the pig pen and then it hit. The prayers of the Father, listen, the prayers of the Father hit him and knocked him to his senses. Amen. Hallelujah. My dad used to always tell me that. It wasn't his prayers that were going to do it. But I'll knock you to your senses. But it was the prayers of the Father that knocked it, brought this boy to his sense, senses. And I believe that our prayers will bring our prodigals to their senses. Yes. So all the time the boy's getting hit with this, he's starting to feel something, something stirring in the pig pen. The father doesn't have a clue what's going on. And the boy's in the pig pen and hits him, and then his father's servants have way more than him. His father's servants are eating better than he is. Here he is dying of hunger and they have more than enough. So in the pig pen, he starts yearning for home. And then all the things that he thought were so restrictive now are starting to look pretty good to him right about now. So I love this and every time I preach from this passage, I bring this up because I just get a picture of what this looks like. He begins in the pig pen, he comes to his senses and he, he's going to head home. And he begins to rehearse this prayer in his mind. Because he's got to have something to say to his father. He can't just show up. So he's got this prayer that he's rehearsed in his mind. He's going to see it's going to go like this. Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And I'm no longer worthy to be your son. So, but if you would just take me on as a hired hand, huh? yeah. Uh, if you would take me on, he's rehearsing it as a servant. Yeah, I'll use the word servant. And so he's rehearsing this over and over in his mind, carefully worded confession. And where is the father? Father doesn't know nothing about this. He's still waiting. He's still watching. He's still praying. And then one day he's out there and he sees something on the, on the horizon out there. And he looks a little bit. It's a long way up. But as he looks a little closer, he, he, he's familiar with that walk. He knows what they're walking. He knows the move out of the eyes. He says, man, that's my son right there. And he sees him a long ways up. So the father goes back into the house. He brings out his double barrel shotgun. He says, you get out of here, you rascal. All the shame that you brought on us. And he starts shooting. No, that's not what he did. While he was still a long ways off, the father saw him. He sees him in these tattered, filthy clothes. And I think that he was even on the windward side of him. He caught a smell of the pig stench coming from him. But what's he do? The Bible says it didn't, he didn't care what he looked like. He didn't care what he smelled like. He felt compassion for him. And he begins running. This old man, I don't know how old he was, but he sees his son. He begins running to his son. Get a picture of that. Imagine what the son is thinking. Oh no, he's coming at me. He's going to run me out. He's going to run me over. That's not what he did. He gets to him. He's got tears streaming down his face. He's got his arms wide open. And he throws his arm around his long lost son. He begins to hug him for all he's worth. He begins to kiss him for all he's worth. And here's the boy totally stunned. And so he said, what am I going to do? Am I? And he breaks into this rehearsed confession and repentance. He says, Father, I have said, and even in the midst of it, he gets cut off. The father never lets him say the rehearsed speech. He gets cut off in the middle of before the words even get out of his mouth. And he tells the servant, he says, get me the best robe and put it on. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. And by the way, get out the biggest stakes that are up there because we are going to celebrate. Hallelujah. And the boy was just sitting there. He said, let me tell you something. After wearing smelly pig soil clothes for so long and eating pig slop for so long, a nice robe with a good steak sounded pretty good to him. And the younger son didn't deserve any of that. I mean, he brought nothing but shame onto the family. And what did he get from the father? No condemnation. No lectures. No restitution. Nothing but love and grace, but it wasn't until after he came out of the pig pen yes. and came home. Yes. You can have unconditional love for your kids in the pig pen, but you don't have to have fellowship with them in the pig pen. Yes. That's right. Oh, that, that just came from the Lord at the right yes. there. We want to have fellowship. We don't want to lose our kids, so we're going to hang out with them in the pig pen. No, no you still love them, yes. but no fellowship in the pig pen. Now the reason that the father was, I'm coming to a close, the re, I think. Unless I find some other new people there. 
Oh, Diane, I don't think Caroline told you that at the end you're supposed to sing a song. Do you have, did you tell them that, Caroline? For altar call. Well, I'm bringing people to altar. Can you, can you do Just As I Am? Do you know that song? Just As I Am. You're interrupting me again. The reason that he was so excited when, when the boy came home is the obvious reason that he was his son. Yes. But more important than that, verse 24 says that this son of mine was dead. And he's come to life again. This son of mine was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Yeah. Now, I look at this, I don't, theologians can spin this all they want. And you, you can have your belief on eternal security. I, I'm not going to take issue with anybody. But that's not what I see here. Even though he was a son, and people tell me that, yes, but he was a son. He never lost his, his right as a son. He never lost being a son. Yes. But while he was in the pig pen, he was, it doesn't say he was backslidden. It doesn't say that he was carnal. While he was in the pig pen, he was dead and he was lost. That's what the Word says. Yes. A son can be lost. A son can be dead. A son can die and go to hell. Unless he comes to his senses. And comes home. He comes home and he's restored. Amen. There's the key right there. After he comes home, he was dead up to that point, but he comes home, he's restored as a son. What a story of a father's heart. Mercy triumphing yeah. over judgment. Yeah. The father had every every right to issue judgment on this boy. Yeah. He gives him mercy. Yes. And then Jesus gets to the part in the story about the other son, the older son. The older son was a hard worker. Verse 25 says that he was out in the field when the boy comes home. He didn't even know anything about it. He's out in the field working in his father's field, working on his father's estate. And so for all these years, he provided continuous and sacrificial and faithful service to his father. While the younger one was out there sowing his wild oats, the elder brother was in the field hard at work diligently sowing seeds for his father. He was working to bring in the harvest. That, that's us in the church. He was an obedient son. Verse 29 tells us that he never disobeyed his father's order. He was submissive to the will of his father. And now he comes out from the field and he hears all this commotion going on. And when he finds out what's going on, that his brother came home there and they're going to make a big uh, meal for him, banquet for him and all that, instead of rejoicing like his father, instead of, wow, my brother come home, this is a great thing. No. He's angry to see all the fuss that's being made over the younger brother. He doesn't deserve it. He's worthless. Now remember throughout the story in the two preceding ones, Jesus tried to drive home the point to the religious leaders who were angry because the sinners were coming to him. And these religious leaders, they couldn't relate to the shepherd who left 99 for 1. Why would you do that? They couldn't relate to the woman who frantically searched her whole house for a small coin that was valuable to her. They couldn't relate how the father received this young man. But they were able to relate to the elder brother who was upset because the prodigal brother came home. Upset that he was getting all the attention. And now Jesus says, that's you. That's you. The sons of the father brought sadness to the fathers of the sons. Both of them, the younger and the older one, broke the father's heart. The younger one, when he left, and he got involved in this lifestyle, and the older one, when he got upset, when the, when the younger one came home. So it broke the father's heart. He was, And the, the younger boy was not even willing to go in. I don't even want to go into that party that you're at. He wanted nothing to do with his brother. Nothing to do with the party. And the father had to come outside the house and convince him to come inside. Parents, if you're a child and you have parents, listen to this. Parents are always hurt the most when their children don't get along with one another. Yeah. There's nothing worse than having a Mother's Day and you got two siblings not getting along. Yeah. 
There's nothing worse than having Father's Day and you got two siblings not getting along. When we won't have anything to do with someone who's been accepted by our Heavenly Father, that places us outside the house. By choosing not to associate with his brother, he was also distant from the Father. Here's this boy, he was self-righteous. He was sure to tell the father all that he had done. Oh, I did this, I didn't do that. I, and, and he made sure that his father all knew all what his brother did. His brother did this, his brother did that. He says, I've always been committed. I've never strayed. I've always obeyed. And he did all of that. But he did it with a bad attitude. He had contempt for this brother. You can relate to this. Listen to how he, listen how he refers to the brother. He doesn't say, he doesn't say I'm angry because my brother came home. He yeah. says, because this son of yours. Yeah. Yeah. You ever say that to your husband, that kid of yours? Yeah. Like, Can't be mine. That's how he says, he says, this son of yours. So that is the sons of the father. But it's the father of the sons that brings it all together. He says, why are you angry? Everything, listen to this, this is good. Everything I have is yours. Yes. Yeah. And any time, if you wanted a banquet, why didn't you just tell me? Yeah. If you wanted a banquet, I would have I would have been grateful to give you a banquet. Yeah. Isn't that what the Word of God says? That you have not because you ask not to the righteous. Yeah. If you wanted a banquet, you should have said so. But he persuades him to go inside. He persuades him to receive his brother. Now, here's the point in closing. If the father had not spoken to the older brother, about his, his about the his younger son, if his attitude hadn't been changed, then the younger son may have been upset with the older son, and he may have left again. Now listen to this. This time for good. Finding more love in the pig pens of the world than in the father's house. And it's a sad thing when people come into the world and they find more love out there in the pig pens of the world than they do in the house of God. There were elder brothers in that religious crowd that day that he was talking to. And there's also elder brothers in the church today. Brothers who show disdain for a person who squanders their rights as a son, but he repents and comes back and is received as one. Brothers who will not fellowship with another brother. I have to go to another church because I can't be in the same room with that one. Yeah, pretty good. That breaks the Father's heart. Yeah. These are the sons of the Father. Yeah. And again, the sins of the Father bring heartache to the sons of the Father. Yeah. But when the sons of the Father go into a distant land and get tangled up in the big bed of the world, when the sons of the Father can't show mercy and grace and can't get along with each other, it brings heartache to the fathers of the sons. Yeah, right. The day that the prodigal came home and the day that the young older son got over his offense was the greatest Father's Day ever yeah. for the Father. Yeah. The sons of the Father brought joy to the heart of the Father. Yeah. Would you bow your heads? And while you're bowing your heads, I want to remind you one more time of one combined service next week as we uh, hope to teach challenge the girls will be here. These are girls that were the undesirables. These are the girls who, who were out there in the streets or whatever they were, and God turned their life around to so come and hear their story. But with your head bowed and your eyes closed, there may be some here today who are in a distant country, a lost sheep, a lost coin, a lost son, a lost daughter. And I want you to know that no matter where you are, like that, lo that coin, you still have value. doesn't matter what you're doing. You have value to God. Yeah. Yeah. This boy came to his senses, and maybe today is the day that you will come to your senses and come out of whatever kind of pink pandemic is that you're in. And come to Jesus. The Father is here at this altar waiting for the sons of the Father. If you need Christ in your life, would you come?
This is your day. He's watching. He's waiting. He's praying for you. His heart is broken. He wants you to come. Lena sang that song. We call out the dry bones come alive. We call out the dead hearts come alive. Anyone. Hallelujah. Come on, anyone else, this is your day. This is I want you. He's out to get you. Maybe we have some elder brothers here today who have a hard time receiving those who come from the big bend of the world and get accepted. And you've been faithful all this time. Maybe there are some like the elder son who refuse to have fellowship with another believer. I'm angry with them. This breaks the Father's heart. On this Father's Day, would you do what you can to make that right, either in your own family or in the family of God? Isn't this wonderful? Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let me read you what the scripture says again. As soon as I find it. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I can't find it, so I'll quote it. There's going to be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that yes. repents and comes to him Amen. than there is all the 99 right. who don't need it. Right. So today, it's not about you. It's about them. Yes. Come on, let's give the Lord praise this morning. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. We rejoice with all heaven today. We rejoice with the angels. Heaven is rejoicing over the lost ones that have come home. We thank you, O oh God, that we've been a part of Amen. Now you need to leave this place and continue to pray for the prodigals. God bless you and happy Father's Day.